On a cold December evening in 1955, 16-year-old Patricia, a high school junior, attended her cousin's wedding. That is where she first laid eyes on 18-year-old airman Lloyd Dwayne Bogle. The instant attraction between them was undeniable. It was like a bolt of lightning. Their connection was deeper than just physical. Within a month of dating, they were talking about marriage. They seemed inseparable, spending a significant amount of time together, going on numerous dates and sharing dreams of a future together. Then, on the night of January 2, 1956, almost a month after they first met, the young couple went on a date to Pete's Drive-In Restaurant for a romantic dinner in the Great Falls area in Montana. Witnesses saw them leaving the drive-in around 9 p.m., heading west out of Central Avenue toward a well-known Lover's Lane close to Wadsworth Park. That was the last anyone saw of them. Neither Patricia nor Duane returned home leaving a mystery in their wake. At precisely 9 p.m., Patricia and Duane departed Pete's drive-in, their final sighting. When Patricia did not arrive home that night, her family concluded she had run away with Duane. Familiarity struck her parents. Patricia's oldest sister had similarly eloped at her age and her parents assumed Patricia had also eloped with Duane. The question swirled in Patricia's parents' minds. Why would she elope? Concern grew as they thought it over. Patricia was not the eloping type. She held an unwavering commitment to her studies, attending high school religiously. College dreams bloomed in her future. Moreover, she valued her curfew, never staying out late. This made her sudden absence even more confounding. And when they thought about Duane, he was more than just a passing acquaintance. He was embraced as family by them. He was wholeheartedly accepted in the family. There was no reason for them to elope. Duane's stature as a rising sergeant second class at Malmstrom Air Force Base added to the perplexity. Assigned to the 29th Fighter Interceptor Squadron, he held a stable position. Together, the couple seemed to lack motives for running away. That same night, two women and two airmen crossed paths with a man sprawled between a car and a tree. Untroubled, they brushed it off, assuming the man was too drunk to drive and had collapsed beside his vehicle. A moment overlooked, a life ignored. The next morning, January 3, 1956, three young boys exploring the Great Falls area stumbled upon a grim sight. They uncovered the remains of 18-year-old Lloyd Duane Bogle. His body lay twisted, partially concealed beneath the car, a chilling discovery etched in the morning light. Duane's wrists were bound by his own belt. A fatal wound pierced his skull. His body lay near the car, its ignition still on, headlights piercing the early morning darkness, a grim scene. Authorities, spurred by a coroner's examination, advised an autopsy. The chilling truth emerged. Duane had been shot, yet the bullet remained undiscovered. The search to find the missing bullet continued. It was a very important clue to catch the perpetrator. In a haunting revelation during the autopsy, it emerged that Duane was alive for several hours after being shot adding layers to the tragedy. Patricia was nowhere to be found. The search for Patricia became paramount. A day passed, the 5th of January, 1956. Patricia's remains were discovered in a rocky ravine, not too far from Duane's. Fully clothed, 
perched at the edge of a steep embankment off an isolated highway in northwest Montana, eight miles from Duane. No signs of robbery or assault were noticed in the initial investigation. A puzzling scene, an expensive camera in Duane's car, a $5 bill in his wallet. Patricia was not indecently assaulted. Motives questioned, motives unclear. There were no apparent signs suggesting Patricia was forcefully subjected to any forms of inappropriate violation when her remains were initially examined. However, during her autopsy, it became apparent that she had likely faced a distressing ordeal by an animalistic abuser. The news reports on the incident merely hinted at this, perhaps due to the sensitivity surrounding the matter during that era. Remember, it was the 1950s. Although DNA analysis was unavailable then, examiners carefully stored a swab for future investigation. Additionally, evidence of multiple injuries implied a vicious struggle between Patricia and her assailant. On that very day, investigators formally questioned a potential suspect. This suspect, an airman who was friends with Duane, had their identity kept confidential. Patricia's mother had sensed Duane's distress a few days earlier, prompting a conversation where he expressed feeling troubled and unable to rid himself of constant grief. He confided about a recent disagreement with a friend. Many believed it was he whom the authorities questioned as a potential suspect. However, this suspect eventually fell out of suspicion. For more than three decades, the case remained unsolved without any substantial leads. In November of 1989, investigators made a pivotal decision to search for the bullet, turning their attention to a nearby tree. Cascade County Sheriff Barry Michelotti revealed the tree's significance, as this cottonwood potentially holds the bullet inside it, highlighting the tree's central role in the case. The recovery of this bullet held immense importance, aiming to uncover the weapon's caliber and possibly connected to firearms seized in other incidents over the years, offering a potential breakthrough in the investigation. Sergeant Dick Duncan knew about the prior unsuccessful attempts to X-ray the tree because of the challenges posed by its immense size and bark density. Towering at approximately 80 feet, with a trunk diameter of around four and a half feet, this tree stood as an obstacle. But this time, they had an audacious plan. To shave off approximately 33 growth rings from the lower portion, anticipating that this action might reveal traces of the bullet's path within the tree, a potential opening or tunnel, a silent witness to the past. Their plan paid off, and the authorities recovered the 33-year-old evidence. Optimism surged when investigators retrieved bullets from the cottonwood tree, reigniting hopes of uncovering the perpetrator. Yet these hopes were quickly dashed as the bullets failed to match with any firearm linked to other criminal activities. Despite the absence of significant breakthroughs, the investigation remained in motion, unwavering in its pursuit of every lead. A staggering 35 individuals were interrogated in connection to the case, showcasing the exhaustive efforts invested in seeking justice. Among the potential suspects in the case stood Edward Wayne Edwards, who had a criminal history dating back to 1956 when he was arrested in Montana for burglary. His criminal escapades intensified when he escaped from Akron Prison in 1955, embarking on a spree of gas station robberies nationwide. By 1961, Edwards had secured a spot on the FBI's most wanted list, 
an honor he held until his capture in 1962. Following his release on parole in 1967, decades passed before he resurfaced in the legal spotlight. In 2009, he faced arrest once more, subsequently confessing in 2010 to brutally taking away the lives of Billy Lavaca, Judith Straub, Tim Hack, Kelly Drew, and Danny Law Glockner. All the victims were young adults close to the age of Duane and Patricia. His dark deeds extended further as he admitted to influencing a U.S. Army soldier, Danny Boy, to go AWOL, before ending his life, too, and burying him in a shallow grave. Although sentenced to be executed in March 2011 for his involvement in Danny Boy's demise, Edward Wayne Edwards passed away in prison merely a month later due to natural causes, evading the full extent of justice for his string of heinous crimes. The link between Edwards and the Duane Patricia tragedy resided in his M.O. Edwards had a chilling tendency to target couples in lovers' lanes, the same location where Patricia and Duane met their untimely end. This disturbing similarity heightened suspicion surrounding Edwards and his potential involvement in the tragic fate of Patricia and Duane. Another suspect under investigation in the Duane Patricia case was James Joseph Whitey Bulger, a well known and infamous criminal within the vicinity. Bulger's criminal history dates back to 1951, marked by an arrest linked to a case of misconduct involving a similar assault as inflicted on Patricia. During the period when the tragic end of Patricia and Duane transpired, Bulger was documented to have been present in the area. However, despite his proximity to the crime scenes, no substantial evidence surfaced to conclusively implicate him in the incidents. As the passage of time dimmed any hope for fresh leads, the pursuit of the elusive perpetrator hit an impasse. However, in 2012, a glimmer of renewed hope emerged when Sergeant John Cadner, taking control as the head of detectives for the CCSO, was tasked with resurrecting this cold case. Sergeant Cadner knew the crucial importance of the DNA evidence extracted from a swab 56 years ago. This key sample, originally sent to the state crime lab in 2001 by Detective Phil Madison during his tenure, only proved the DNA did not match Duane's genetic profile. Therefore, it was catalogued in CODIS, Combined DNA Index System. The database, unfortunately, it failed to yield any promising matches, leaving the case to go cold again. Sergeant Cadner teamed up with Bode Technology to recreate the DNA sample when he got the case. By 2019, they had successfully made the sample again. This time, they did not just compare it with the samples in CODIS. They also checked it against DNA from regular people in open source DNA databases. These databases are used by people who want to learn about their family history. Just a year before, in 2018, the Golden State Offender was caught because some of his family members had given their DNA to a similar open-source DNA database. This helped identify and arrest him. The sample Sergeant Cadner uploaded matched three individuals. Investigators reached out to them and their families. They collected DNA samples and found that an individual named Kenneth Gould was the closest match to the foreign DNA obtained from Patricia's swab. Sergeant Cadner expressed, This was amazing, because after 65 years, we finally had a lead and a location to explore. 
Everything was just theories before this. Now we had a solid lead and a name. It completely shifted the case's dynamics. Authorities encountered a new hurdle. Kenneth Gould had passed away in 2007, and authorities could not exhume his remains to get a DNA sample. Kenneth Gould was cremated in 2007. This presented a challenge. Yet they contacted Kenneth Gould's children, explaining the situation and the case. Surprisingly, the children agreed to provide their DNA for comparison. Initially unsure of their response, investigators were pleasantly surprised by their full cooperation. Sergeant Kadner shared, I was not certain how they would react when I approached them about their dad being a suspect in this case, but they were incredibly helpful. Upon comparing their DNA with the sample found at the crime scene, it turned out to be a match. Kenneth Gould hailed from Great Falls and was recognized for riding his horses around the Vineyard Road area where Patricia's remains were discovered. Intriguingly, he had resided close to Patricia's parents at one point, yet there was no apparent link between him and either Patricia or Duane. Notably, when Gould was 25 years old, he married a 16-year-old, the same age Patricia was at the time of the slayings. A month after Patricia and Duane's tragic end, Gould abruptly altered the course of his life. He uprooted his entire existence, relocating his family first to Tracy, then to Geraldine, and later to Hamilton, before eventually leaving the state of Montana entirely, settling in Missouri without any intention of returning. Kenneth Gould was deemed the most likely suspect in the slayings. However, because he had passed away, his culpability could not be conclusively established without a proper trial. Sergeant Kadner conveyed his perspective, emphasizing that while they could not definitively prove Gould's guilt as he was no longer alive, the collective evidence strongly pointed toward him as the prime suspect. He highlighted that while they could not physically place the weapon in Gould's hand, Considering all the gathered information and circumstances, there was a high level of certainty in his mind regarding Gould's involvement in the crime. Kenneth Gould's daughter mentioned to Sergeant Kadner that some individuals harbor hidden secrets, implying that her father might have had secrets unknown to anyone else. Following the identification of Kenneth Gould as the suspect, the families of Dwayne Bogle and Patricia Kalitsky were finally approached, offering them the closure they had sought for over six decades. While relieved to have closure and answers after such a prolonged period, the revelation also resurfaced painful memories for the families, especially for those who had personal connections with the couple. Sergeant Kadner empathetically noted, The families are experiencing a mix of emotions. It is a bittersweet moment. Duane and Patricia were vibrant and well-liked by many. Investigators invested deeply in this case, leaving a part of themselves in the pursuit of justice, which makes this closure heartfelt yet challenging. Patricia Kalitsky's sister, the sole surviving member of her family had succumbed to advanced dementia by the time the identity of the perpetrator was revealed. The Bogle family had endured years of turmoil, with speculations about Duane's fate, including unverified rumors linking him to the mob. Duane's niece, Karen Bogle McCarthy, who was 54 at the time of the revelation, reflected on the impact of modern technology on their generation. She acknowledged that while technological advancements had their merits, they also reignited deeply buried wounds that had started to heal. In an interview, Edgar Wilson, Kenneth Gould's neighbor for a decade in Missouri, 
expressed utter disbelief about the accusations against Gould. Wilson described Gould as mild-mannered, non-confrontational, and inherently good, portraying him as a genuinely good person who did not engage in vices like drinking or causing trouble. During his time in Missouri, Gould resided on a farm with his family, earning respect as an exceptional horse trainer. He also tended to sheep and goats at his farm. An unsubstantiated theory is that Kenneth Gould secretly loved Patricia, and when all of a sudden Patricia fell for Duane, and only after a month of dating they were thinking of marrying, is when Kenneth decided to take the matters into his own hands. He confronted the couple on the lover's lane, and when he saw the couple involved in intimacy in the car, it enraged Kenneth Gould, and he held the couple at gunpoint. He tied up Dwayne with his own belt and threatened him to leave Patricia. When Dwayne disagreed, he took his life right next to his car. He then kidnapped Patricia, took her eight miles away into the wilderness, and had his way with her before taking her life as well. However, there are some irregularities in his theory. There was a big age difference between Kenneth and Patricia of almost 13 years. But many argued that Kenneth actually married his wife when she was the same age as Patricia, 16 years old, and he was 25 years old at his wedding. More so, this incident happened only four years after Kenneth's marriage. Did the words of Kenneth Gould's daughter that everyone has hidden secrets mean something more? Could it be the daughter knew about her father's infatuation with Patricia somehow, or was it just a passing statement? The motive behind the crime remains unknown, as three individuals who could shed light on it have all passed away. Was it a brutal end to a love triangle? or a moment of weakness where, by and large, a benign human being became an animal for a night? Was it the doing of a single perpetrator, or were there more than one assailant? Those who could have answered these questions have passed away. Darlene Zetterauer, born to Wilma Joyce and Robert Charles Zetterauer of Savannah, Georgia, shared an unbreakable bond with Barbara Susan Schreiber, lovingly known as Barbie. Both girls, born just months apart in 1961, were the epitome of friendship. They both finished eighth grade at Atuk's Middle School and were excited to start their much-awaited summer in Hollywood, Florida. On the fateful evening of June 18, 1975, the teenagers, Barbara and Darlene, left Barbara's Hollywood home, assuring Barbara's mother that they were headed to spend the night at their friend Valerie's house. The details of their movements that night are shrouded in conflicting reports. However, most accounts suggest they stopped by the home of a friend, Gail, a close friend of Darlene. It was a sunny June day in 1975 when Barbara Schreiber and Darlene Zetterauer, both 14 years old, strolled down the streets of their Hollywood neighborhood. They paused on a bench at the corner of Sterling Road and Northwest 40th Street. Gail, the last verified person to see the best friends alive, vividly recalls spotting them sitting together on a busy street bench in Hollywood, near the intersection of Route 441 and Hollywood Boulevard. Her memories of Darlene paint a picture of a lively, fun-loving girl with a unique way of pulling back her hair with her fingers. Like many other youngsters of their time, neither of the girls owned a car or knew how to drive. Lacking transportation of their own, they often relied on hitchhiking to reach their destinations. The trio enjoyed the carefree summer days before high school where laughter filled the air. But on that fateful day, Gail recalls a white van suddenly pulling up near the bench. 
Gail witnessed both girls willingly getting into the white van. Once the door closed, their fate was sealed. Unlike Gail, Darlene and Barbara were bold and outgoing girls. Gail wanted to join them on their escapades, but she had a strict father who would not have approved of her entering a stranger's van. Gail ultimately decided to stay back. It was this keen parental guidance that ultimately saved Gail's life, as it was the last time Darlene and Barbara were seen alive. Barbara and Darlene vanished without a trace. The reason behind this appalling abduction became a haunting mystery. Then, on the morning of June 19, 1975, a family on a fishing trip stumbled upon the lifeless bodies of two teenage girls. It was Darlene and Barbara. They lay side by side along the canal, a shocking scene paralleling Highway 27, approximately four miles north of Andytown, an outpost for truckers that has long faded into history. Investigators revealed a chilling truth. Both victims had suffered a fatal gunshot wound, likely from a large caliber bullet, perhaps a 45, evident from the substantial amount of blood at the scene. Blood splatter analysis indicated that both the girls met their untimely demise where their bodies were found. Conflicting reports emerged regarding their state of clothes, with some suggesting they were fully clothed, while others hinted at the possibility of something even more sinister. They were both brutally forced before the fatal massacre. Following the discovery of the girls' bodies, Gail, the last person to have seen them alive, expressed her apprehension to the media. I was scared for them, she recounted. I did not understand what was happening. I am grateful that I did not follow them into that unknown situation. I think the person behind us was just a sick individual, Gail remarked solemnly. The overwhelming uncertainty surrounding the events leading to the tragic end of Barbara and Darlene cast a shadow over the community. The initial investigation led the detectives to Valerie, the supposed host of the planned sleepover, which revealed a stark truth. The teens had never arranged to spend the night. It was a ploy often used by Barbara and Darlene when they sought to venture out without their parents' knowledge. According to investigators from Broward County, witness interviews suggested the girls might have been attempting to hitch a ride north, possibly in pursuit of illicit substances. Despite the immense community and media support drawn by the innocence and youth of the victims, the lack of modern technology posed insurmountable barriers for investigators in capturing the elusive perpetrator. There were no leads, no technology to trace their steps, making it an immensely challenging case from the start. The case went cold. Broward County Sheriff Detective Andrew Giannino bore the weight of the cold case for decades. A relentless pursuit of justice that consumed dozens of detectives, deputies, crime scene investigators, and forensic specialists from the Broward Sheriff's Office. Their unwavering dedication to unveil the truth behind the cold case eventually reaped fruit decades later. In early 2023, the Broward Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit took charge. They were met with stacks of reports, numerous crime scene photos, boxes of evidence, and the clothing worn by Barbara and Darlene. Detective Roberto Caceres from the BSO Crime Scene Unit meticulously examined Darlene's clothing, isolating DNA trapped within the garment fibers. This meticulous process finally yielded what the detectives had been waiting for, nearly 50 years. The cold case unit managed to extract a complete DNA profile of the suspect after nearly half a century of fruitless actions. 
Equipped with this breakthrough, investigators conducted extensive searches through databases, finally yielding a match. The cold case unit made a definitive link, identifying a man named Robert Clark Keebler as the primary suspect in the case, established through his biological artifacts. The revelation offered a beacon of progress after years of tormenting uncertainty, moving closer toward justice for Barbara and Darlene. The exploration into Robert Clark Keebler's history uncovered a troubling record of armed robbery, forced intercourse, and aggravated assault spanning from California to South Florida. Authorities confirmed Keebler passed away in 2019 in South Florida, closing the door on the chance for direct accountability. Yet the pursuit of answers for the victims' families persisted. Detective Giannina's investigation led him to believe that Robert Clark Keebler drove Barbara and Darlene to the isolated Everglades, where he subjected them to horrific assault before shooting them. Before the DNA testing, there had been no evidence linking him to the case. As the case concluded with a sense of closure, a new chapter of inquiry unfolds. Investigators now scrutinize the possibility of Keebler's involvement in the flat tire slaying, unsolved cases in South Florida. The quest for DNA evidence linking these crimes with Barbara and Darlene's tragedy persists as detectives tirelessly sift through the past for clues. Barbara and Darlene were denied the chance to embrace life's fullness and remain mourned by their families and those who cherished them. Their stories serve as a poignant reminder of lives cut short, their potential forever unrealized, a tragedy etched into the annals of history, yearning for answers and justice that may yet be found in the collective remembrance and contributions of the community.